new video, new day. I'm wearing, because I'm going to have a conversation with mom about effective altruism. She just finished reading Doing Good Better, and that's what this video is going to be about. Also, get to drive the convertible back up to my parents' house, and I wish you hadn't missed it, but a convertible red VW just drove by, and I happen to have one of those as well, and so we were instant friends, and you missed it. Uh, okay, let's drive. Exciting news, Dad's just put, Dad just put up new numbers on our house and also a uh, like cool little decorative sun. Check it out. All right, so we're going to, we're just out here on the deck. Hi, Mom. Uh, we're talking about effective altruism, which she just finished reading today, and I finished reading about a week ago before the conference. Uh, sorry, not effective altruism. Doing good better is it's the name really of the book. Wonderful message. Doing good better. So uh, we're just gonna discuss, uh, sort of free form, some of the points that stood out to us uh, in the book. So. Yeah, I found it really um, just fascinating that. You know, we have all the uproar and commotion and protests about 99% that are left behind because of the 1% that are controlling and doing everything. In our country, that's so basically um, inappropriate to say that because anybody living in, in a developed nation, anybody in the world that lives in what's considered to be a developed we are the one percent. Abject poverty, and put it in terms of what that means in in the United States. Not to say that we don't have great empathy and concern for people who are living in abject poverty in our own country, but you know, eleven thousand dollars a year. Yeah, that's bad news. But people that are living on five hundred and fifty dollars a year. That's pretty astounding. And, and you know, all of it's scaled. So they talk about, you know, what's the value in a country who really the people are making something that low. Of course, they can buy a loaf of bread maybe for 50 cents, but still in the scale of return. Yeah. Leon. Yeah, so the interesting point about this that I, I hadn't realized is when you hear facts and figures like, the poverty line is like a dollar ninety cents. Uh, so anyone living under two dollars a day is is in the the what Object the World poverty. Bank declares is like poverty, the poverty line. So um, what is interesting about that is that that's adjusted for where they live. It it's is. what two American dollars could buy here that's in America. So like think about if you had to live on two U.S. dollars with what you could buy in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Like they live on the equivalent amount, which is far, far less than two actual U.S. dollars in their country. That's a good point. That's it's what crazy. I was trying to say. That's but really wild to think about. I didn't know that the figure was, was put together that way. So the point made is that there is a lot we can do about global poverty because, I mean, you know, we only have one salary, but at $36,000, that's equivalent to, you know, like hundreds of people's, lifting hundreds of people out of poverty around the world. Uh, with just like a small 10% of your income donation. Uh, just the, the fact that you can have that kind of impact is kind of counterintuitive and really, really, really crazy that it's true and hard to think about because it, it really makes you confront the fact that, oh, wow, you know, I'm not, not doing anything about this right now and I really should. If I can be having that big an impact, I need to think seriously about this. So that's sort of what inspired me to go to the conference in the first place and it's I'm, I'm really happy that the book communicates that so effectively. I think the book really communicates just a little bit of giving on our end can impact in ways that are unimaginable. Wait, okay, go. Yeah. How can my life, how can I in my life effectively contribute to the overall good in the world by saving lives? Yeah by doing things that matter, and, and they bring up, he brings up the fact that you can, you can give to some really great charities, 
all of us have our favorite charities that we give to. You know, I research four or five every year to give away at Christmas. But he went further than just saying, well, here, here are the ones that you normally see checked off as being great and their money's effectively used. But even more important was how does that, that charity that you're giving to actually impact an individual on the receiving end? It's not just how effective does the charitable organization do research or give the proceeds of their funds they intake to, to doing things and how much of it is overhead and how much of it is this and that. But the ones he highlighted are the ones whose value is felt from the actual payoff to the person you're trying to help in, in some impoverished country. So the argument made is not that like the overhead of a charitable organization matters as much as uh, organizations like uh, Charity Navigator tend to indicate. Uh, and instead, uh, Will talks about how you can rate uh, or sort of determine a charity's effectiveness by instead measuring how many quality adjusted life years they provide for the people they serve. So quality adjusted life years is a way to measure sort of how you're improving either a person's life expectancy or the quality of their life. So if you say cure someone of blindness and they would live for just as long but now they'd enjoy or benefit from their life twice as much qualitatively as they otherwise would have, uh, that's something you can measure. And then also if you're saving someone's life who would have died much earlier, that's something you can measure. And you can measure those both using the same metric which is a quality adjusted life year. So it provides this great framework for rating charities based on how much the average donation restores, you know, uh, in, uh, quality an expected quality adjusted life year. It's really, yeah, one year of quality life, how much do you, of that do you give to the world? And that's something that you can, you can determine from, from any kind of charity, right? Mm -hmm. So like, if you don't have free access to books, and having free access to books improves your life by 10%, then you can say every 10 years you have free access to books, you are restoring a quality adjusted life year, the same way that if you, you know, saved a person a year of their life, uh, you would have restored a quality adjusted life year. It's a really interesting metric that breaks down well. And so measuring charities by that turns out to be really, really great for figuring out where you might want to donate your money and make the biggest impact in a material way that actually improves people's lives. Five areas that he um, addressed that he said are five key questions that anyone should ask when they're, they're trying to assess whether something they're going to do altruistically will really benefit. The five questions are, how many people benefit and by how much? And how can you save hundreds of lives? That is, is this the most effective thing you can do? That's number two. Number three, is this area a neglected area? So why shouldn't we donate to disaster relief? Uh, number four, what would have happened otherwise? Yeah, so if we don't do what we are feeling compelled and interested in doing to help others, what is the effect? What would have happened otherwise? And then number five is what are the chances of success and how good would success be? Got a little sub-question. Why is voting like donating to charity? Really good question for us to ask in this year where we're all kind of what? <laughs> What's going on politically? Oh no, I don't think I'll vote. <laughs> Those kind of things. Just how important it is that you make a decision, you go out and exercise that. Just as you would give thousands of dollars to charity to help and benefit people. I think one of the areas I really enjoyed reading about too, um, effective altruism in action. He talked about um, things other than just the poverty in the world and addressing poverty through charitable giving, but other things in our lives that make a big impact on other people. Um, like? Well, like the decision to pursue a certain career path. Oh, right. And he talked about the value added 
in any given career path that you might choose. You might think you are doing well to say choose being a doctor because you're going to help, you're going to save a lot of people and you're going to contribute to, you know, get rid of disease and maybe all your research will be aimed in a certain direction that you're passionate about because maybe you're very close relative died of cancer so you want to further cancer research but how the important questions become how much is already being done in those areas he, he said something like 897,000 doctors exist in the United States and adding one more doctor if you decide to pursue that you know can be a great thing but if you compare it to the value added of maybe doing something that is globally more important or is extraordinarily neglected or is extraordinary right? 900,000 people aren't already working on that's an important point that that area of is this area neglected right extremely important cool my consciousness was raised a little bit I've always kind of had the feeling but he talked about things that we tend to label as bad and in the bigger picture of things, maybe it's not bad on the receiving end as we would perceive it, just looking at it from an observation, observational third party. For example, sweatshops. You know, you just, oh, you cringe and think, oh my God, the conditions are horrible in you know, sweatshops. We should. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Take them I... out of Take them out of India and, and do anything you can to shut right. it down. Right, do anything you can to avoid sweatshops. And, and then he talks about how sweatshops are actually like a rising nation's key to developmental maturity yeah. and to independence. But and people, that like every single culture has to go through this like sweatshop awful labor phase mm -hmm. as a way to industrialize. And the alternatives to sweatshop, so he brings up the counterfactual a lot uh, in, in terms of just like asking what would happen if the thing that you're assuming is bad wasn't going on. Uh, and oftentimes, especially with sweatshops, what you assume, you know, any alternative would be better. Actually, all of the alternatives to working in a sweatshop are Ooh, awful. Horrible. Uh, and a sweatshop is like one of the best paying, like most prestigious jobs. In, in countries where sweatshops work economically, they work because people, they're a great opportunity for people who were otherwise in poverty can now provide for themselves. They're standing in line to work in those sweatshops. And once one of us in our altruistic mode decides to shut it down or quit doing business, he talks a lot about buying, yeah, yeah. Quit buying from. He talks about how free trade actually turns out to be kind of a like a runaround, and that the people who should benefit from free trade packaged goods mm -hmm. often don't get paid extra because you you bought a free trade good that will cost more. Often the middlemen get paid more, and they're already paid well enough. So really really interesting challenging of assumptions that just like the things you think are good that you're doing when you eat a certain way or buy certain products or turn out to be not so great and like the things that people uh, dedicate their lives to like eliminating sweatshop labor and like not actually great solutions to the problem of you know a, a rising industrial nation has to go through phases like that really interesting stuff we get on a high horse and we chastise a celebrity for having their clothing line produced in the Indian sweatshop or we, we're swatting at Apple for having some of their devices made under really pretty horrific conditions if we're making our judgments some things in China. But it's all going back to the message of don't destroy something that in, in the eyes of those that are on the other side of the table, they value that and they think it's really a step for their economy to be making to get them into a, a more elevated place in a world economy. We went through it, you know, in the Industrial Revolution, we've been through in our country child labor and laws having to be passed to keep kids out of, off the farms and out of the fields and in school, but it was a progression that we had to go through to get to where we are. And it's not something you can just skip and make better. Mm -mm, mm -mm. It's very interesting to you about the chapter on careers. Well, I think that the message I got was you don't have to give up your passion. You can still have this, this um, 
life source within inside you that says, I get so much satisfaction from this. This is such a great thing in my life. I wish that I could work that into my effective work life because I'm so impassioned about it. But he was saying that maybe the better question is that when we're choosing careers, we're thinking about um, the giving aspect of what we're doing. Whether that comes from making an extremely good salary so that I can give more to help other people, or whether at a lower salary, whatever I'm doing on a daily basis is helping other people. I'm being generous with my time. And Will talks about this from the point of, uh, the point of view of being more effective, too, with your decisions. He says that... Uh, often when you make decisions like, what's my passion? How can I follow? It's unclear, and then it leads you to make decisions that aren't necessarily the best, the outcomes you want. Uh, he talks about sort of the research on what makes a good career, right? And feeling connected to your work and feeling like you're doing things that matter and being able to really help and assist people are very important for most people's career enjoyment. And so he says that maybe, the, maybe a better way to structure your decisions in order to achieve a meaningful career would be, you know, h how can I best balance sort of my skill set versus things the world needs a lot and things that would actually provide benefit to people. I love, I love this part. He says, Re research shows that the most consistent predictor of job satisfaction is engaging work, which can be broken down into five factors. Number one, independence. To what extent do you have control? over how you go about your work. Number two, sense of completion. To what extent does the job involving, involve completing a whole piece of work so that your contribution to the end product is easily visible? Number three, variety. To what extent does the job require you to perform a range of different activities using different skills and talents? Number four, feedback from the job. How easy is it to know whether you're performing well or badly? And number five, contribution. To what extent does your work make a difference is defined by positive contributions to the well-being of other people. Just a real interesting metric he talked about. That's really great. Okay, so what do you think was the biggest takeaway for you from this book? What things will you remember from reading it for the long term? I think for me, um, that I will be more purposeful when I think about giving to help other people or to help um, with causes that I feel are, are things I'm wanting to support. And I think that um, I'll also look for ways just in my own community where I can give back, you know, whether it's volunteering or whether it's um, maybe su supporting some political cause or some, it just, for me, it raised an awareness or reminded me of an awareness level that I just haven't given much attention to in, in several years. I mean, I used to always give regularly to the church because that was just part of what we did, you know, giving a, a few hundred here every month or so. And once I wasn't giving so regularly to the church, I looked for other things to give to, to still feel like I was being helpful and, and doing something that was of service to the more to the community or more to our own country. But I think what it's done is raised my awareness level of um, to be more focused on how a contribution of some sort can have a global impact and how that might be even a better barometer of effectiveness than a local impact. Yeah, I came away thinking a lot of the same things. Like, there's a whole new range of things that I want to pay attention to when I think about altruism and how I'm benefiting other people and what things I'm caring about. Uh, and then also a point we forgot to touch on is the one you just mentioned, that policy is one of the super neglected things that, like, only politicians uh, really concern themselves with policy making and with public advocacy and so there's a huge dearth of 
large groups of people who care a lot about what policy is being made and that's a, a place you can make a potentially really 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 big really meaningful impact is by um, advocating publicly for uh, laws and practices that are effective altruism and then also maybe participating in the political process yourself uh, running for a local office or for a public office a national yeah so lots of different opportunities that sort of get highlighted in ways you otherwise would not have thought about them it's a really good book for just it sort is. of challenging some of your assumptions about your impact on the world around you and i think on the political front a lot of times one doesn't think about the gift that is really being given by public service by even running for an office or being a member of a, a city council or a governor of a state or a senator or a representative even at the state level the amount that you really are giving to to people because you care enough to care about the laws to care about their lives their daily lives their um, what the government can do or can't do. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, you just sometimes don't even realize the impact. I think if I had to come up with a pithy takeaway for, for doing good better, it's that a lot of people who want to do really good in the world automatically assume that the best way to do that is to become a doctor. And it turns out that maybe the best way to do that is to become a politician. And I don't think you would have expected that. <laughs> and there are a million other really counterintuitive insights. It's a great book. Uh, and something you should definitely check out if you're interested in helping others or doing good, or making sure that your life gives back to the world. Okay. It's the young man who wrote the book. He looks very young. He's an associate professor. He's the Oxford, youngest associate professor in the world. At Oxford University. Yeah. I, I imagine, yeah, look at that. It's pretty wild. Yeah. You did a good job writing this book. It's very, very, it's like a great read. It's and really I love that. I love one other thing too. He talked about eight, eighty thousand hours of our work life. Eighty thousand hours represents the average work life of a person who who gives forty years of service to a job or to some right. endeavor they they've signed up for, and, and the importance of feeling good about that. Oh, and of taking time to really like account for the way you're spending that eighty thousand hours. I mean, any significant thing that you do that you're going to spend a long time on it makes sense to spend like 10 percent of it sort of deciding what to do or how to do it but yet people rarely do that with their careers if you have 80,000 hours right people very rarely spend 8,000 hours deciding what career they want to be in and like really crunching the numbers on what they should do with their lives so 80,000 hours is, is an organization you can go to the links in the description 80,000 hours.org is the website that advocates for Intentional decision making when it comes to career choices can help you sort of make those decisions like doctor versus politician versus entrepreneur versus lawyer. Yeah, he he touch, touches on a lot of important causes, yeah. you know, climate change, there, there, social justice, not there social justice, are, um, criminal justice. There are several uh, uh, related, so effective altruism is like the overall uh, social cause, I suppose. Um, but there, there are some related things, uh, all of which I will put links for in the description. One is 80,000 hours. Another is called Giving What We Can, which advocates a 10%, sort of like tithing, mm -hmm. uh, except that 10% of your income will go to the most effective charities uh, from, from a list that they research really heavily. And I got to talk to several people at the Effective Altruism uh, Conference about how they research these organizations and what they do is they do a really broad overview of all charitable organizations and they find the ones that that look from a higher level to be very impactful and then they take a slightly smaller number of them that they've selected as the really impactful organization and they do a deeper level of research and then they use that level of research to determine an even even small and smaller number of organizations that are really really effective and they research those even more in depth and it gets to the point where they have five or six organizations that are picked out really one or two of which are the most effective where they know the people who are doing the work and they've built a personal relationship with them and they really get to know the way the organization works and do research into how they're carrying out their charitable mission and so uh, the organization that does all that research is affiliated with giving what we can it's called give well and they do all the research into what uh, charities are most effective and then there's an animal uh, analog 
of GiveWell, which is called, I think just Animal Charity Effectiveness or something like that, ACE. Uh, and they determine which animal charities are the most effective. And so there are all these different offshoot organizations from effective altruism and from doing good better and uh, all the stuff that Will has put together with friends from Oxford and with people who are, I mean, it's just a few thousand people right now who are putting together this movement and who are building these companies. And it's a really, really exciting time. And it's uh, really informative and surprising and exciting. So hopefully you enjoyed us talking a little bit about it. Thank you for watching. I really felt like that I would become a vegetarian after reading this <laughs> Yeah, no, I've, I've considered pretty heavily going vegan. I'm at least cutting chicken out of my diet, yeah. like for sure. Beef. I've never felt worse about eating chicken nuggets beef ever in my life. I know, it makes you feel uh, really sad. But yeah, it makes you want to cut out beef and chicken at the very least. Uh, and then maybe stick to bacon and other things. Bacon. <laughs> but, you Pigs know. Pigs don't have it that good either. <laughs> They really don't, uh, and it goes into some detail on that, so really so interesting our, stuff to think about. Yeah, we're co-inhabitants of the planet. You know, our animal friends that are here, and some of them are here for six weeks just to serve purposes of being our food. Yeah, and it's so strange that like we're okay with that, and no one ever talks about it. No so one. that's a matter that's brought up in this book as well. Yeah, so some really interesting points. Thanks for talking about it, Mom. I'm glad you like the book. I did. You know the little video that you put up today where you gave a real quick overview of the conference? What's it called? I have no... Uh, do you remember like what yeah, number it, it was or what it's called? It was, um, I think it was like your third video for today and it was a, um, a summary of effective altruism conference in mm -hmm. like five minutes. Cool. And this young, this young man was the first guy up at the podium. Oh yeah. But it was before you had gotten the book, so he he just came and went really fast. I went, oh there he is. That's funny. I want to hear a little more. Yeah, I, I'm sure his speeches from the conference are online by now. I, I should find links to those and put those in the description too. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool.